That uh, song probably, uh, you know, comes from 2 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 9. And you might remember that uh, section of Scripture where the Apostle Paul was speaking about the thorn in the flesh and how it was that uh, he asked God three times to take that away from him. And God, you'll remember, said to him, no, he would not remove it from him because it would keep Paul humble so that God was much more concerned about Paul's humility than he was about Paul's comfort. God could have just immediately removed that thorn from the Apostle Paul, but he chose not to do it. And there are are circumstances and situations in our lives that keep us weak on purpose so that we are clinging to God, so that we're looking to him. That's why you have exhortations in the Bible that say things like this. Ephesians 6.10, be strong in the Lord in the power of his might. In 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 1, Paul wrote to a pastor, you therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And where also Paul had written to a church in Philippians chapter 4 and verse 1, he said, stand firm in the Lord, not in yourself. Don't be strong in yourself. Don't stand firm in yourself. Stand firm in the Lord, in Christ, because he is the one who has the resources for us that we need, strength in weakness. He doesn't want us to pull ourselves up by our own bootstraps apart from him. No, he wants us to be strong in him and the things of him. Would you open your Bibles, please, to Acts 22? Acts 22. We'll finish this chapter this morning. We'll start into chapter 23. And um, there's going to be a lot of rather different kind of material when it comes to what we have been, coming up, have been covering. And just to give you a little bit of an overview of what we're going to see, we're going to see anger here. Unmistakable. We are going to see anger. We are going to see God's grace and patience. We are going to see what it is to have a good conscience. We're going to see something of Paul's own humanity and sinfulness. The Apostle Paul. We are going to see something of the importance of the hope of the resurrection. And we're going to see how it is that Jesus comes alongside his own in their darkest of hours. Let's pick up the reading in verse 22. Acts 22 and verse 22. So up to this, up to this word, they listened to him. They raised their their voices and said, Away with such a fellow from the earth, for he should not be allowed to live. And they were shouting and throwing off their cloaks and flinging dust into the air. The tribune ordered him to be brought into the barracks, saying that he should be examined by flogging to find out why they were shouting against him like this. But when they had stretched him out for the whips, Paul said to the centurion who was standing by, Is it lawful for you to flog a man who is a Roman citizen and uncondemned? When the centurion heard this, he went to the tribune and said to him, What are you about to do? For this man is a Roman citizen. So the tribune came and said to him, Tell me, Are you a Roman citizen? He said, yes. The tribune answered, I bought this citizenship for a large sum. Paul said, I'm a citizen from birth. So those who were about to examine him withdrew from him immediately. And the tribune also was afraid. For he realized that Paul was a Roman citizen and that he had been bound 
But on the next day, desiring to know the real reason why he was being accused by the Jews, he unbound him and commanded the chief priests and all the council to meet, and he brought Paul down and set him before them. And looking intently at the council, Paul said, Brothers, I have lived my life before God in all good conscience up to this day. And the high priest Ananias commanded those who stood by him to strike him on the mouth. Then Paul said to him, God is going to strike you, you whitewashed wall. Are you sitting to judge me according to the law? And yet contrary to the law, you order me to be struck? Those who stood by said, Would you revile God's high priest? And Paul said, I did not know, brothers, that he was the high priest, for it is written, You shall not speak evil of the ruler of your people. Now when Paul perceived that one part were Sadducees and the other Pharisees, he cried out in the council, Brothers, I am a Pharisee, a son of Pharisees. It is with respect to the hope and the resurrection of the dead that I am on trial. And when he had said this, a dissension rose between the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and the the assembly was divided. For the Sadducees say that there's no resurrection, nor angel, nor spirit, but the Pharisees acknowledge them all. Then a great clamor arose, and some of the scribes of the Pharisees' party stood up and contended sharply, We find nothing wrong in this man. What if a spirit or an angel spoke to him? When the dissension became violent, the tribune, afraid that Paul would be torn to pieces by them, commanded the soldiers to go down and take him away from among them by force and bring them into the barracks. The following night, the Lord stood by him and said, Take courage. For as you have testified to the facts about me in Jerusalem, so you must testify also in Rome. We see here in this context, beyond or before the text that we read this morning, we see that the Apostle Paul was being falsely accused. Take a look at it with me in chapter 21 and verse 28. It says, they, the, the people there, the Jews, were crying out, Men of Israel, help! This is the man who is teaching everyone everywhere against the people and the law and this place. Moreover, he even brought Greeks into the temple and has defiled this holy place. These were false accusations. The Apostle Paul was not guilty of doing these things. These were drummed up by the religious people, the Jews, against the Apostle Paul. Now, the uh, uh, Jewish law was that if a Gentile was to go into the court of the Jews, that more inter part of the temple, that was worthy of death. So that's why they're drumming up this, this accusation against Paul in order, frankly, for him to die and be killed, for him to be executed. See, he had not defiled the Holy holy of Holies. He had not defiled the court of the Jews. And he had simply ministered the gospel to the Gentiles in the court of the Gentiles. So Paul here is arrested. We saw that earlier. We saw that he was bound in verse 33. He had been bound with two chains. So Paul here is going to appear or have a defense Uh, with respect to the tribune and with respect to the council. He is going to first have a defense uh, before the tribune and then before the council. The end of verse 21 here is telling, just before the text that we're starting today. The Apostle Paul had just given his testimony And at the end of his testimony, we find in verse 21, given for us in the story, Paul is saying that God had chosen him to go to the Gentiles. This is telling 
because for Judaism, for a Gentile to be converted to Judaism, they regarded as fantastic. No problem with that whatsoever, that, he, that Gentiles should be converted. However, when Paul made this statement, what he was clearly saying to all of those people was that God was calling him to minister the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ to the Gentiles so that they may turn to Christ away from Judaism. See, the Jews hated the Gentiles with passion, with hatred. And so this made them extremely mad. Pick it up in verse 22. And this is the people's reaction and if you're following the outline. Up to this point, they listened to him. Then they raised their voices and said, Away with such a fellow from the earth. He should not be allowed to live. What set them off? But what set them off was, he, Paul, was telling them that it was he himself that was representing God and not them. So they, that was intolerable for them. That was completely unexcusable for them. So how do they demonstrate the fact that they were angry? Well, in the end of verse 22, they cry out and they say, get rid of this guy. He shouldn't even be allowed to continue to live. And then in verse 23, look what they were doing to show their reaction to what Paul had said. And as they were shouting and throwing off their cloaks and flinging dust into the air. What a, what a, what a vivid, vivid imagery of people being extremely angry. They're reaching down to the ground, they're picking up dust, and they're throwing it into the air. They're so upset. It's a demonstration of their anger, their hatred for the Gentiles, and how mad they were at Paul himself. So we see here the people's reaction. They're yelling, they're calling for his death, they're shouting, they're throwing off their cloaks, and they're flinging dust in the air. Now the tribune sets, uh, steps in. Who is the tribune? What is a tribune? A tribune was a, a military official that typically was over 3,000 soldiers. It was an elected position. It was a man of military authority. And here the tribune is involved in this particular scenario. Look at verse 24. The tribune ordered him to be brought into the barracks, saying that he should be examined by flogging to find out why they were shouting against him like this. But when they had stretched him out for the whips, Paul said to the centurion who was standing by. We'll stop there. So here what we find is that the tribune steps in. This officer, this official, this, this man with this, this role of authority, he comes in and what does he do? He orders the centurion, a man over a hundred soldiers, to prepare him to be scourged. So they set him up, Paul, that he might then be scourged. Paul here, we find, we find here Paul's response. Paul was not silent. Paul did not keep his mouth closed. And I'm not saying that against him. I'm not saying that in any critical way whatsoever. Paul reacted. Paul responded. And it's found for us in uh, the last section of verse 25. And it says here that Paul then asks the centurion a question. And in asking him that question, he, Paul, is revealing to the centurion that he knew very well Roman law. And what is the question he asks? Is it lawful for you to flog a man who is a Roman citizen and uncondemned? Isn't it interesting to you? Don't you find it interesting the way that Paul responds to this? Rather than Paul condemning them, 
Rather than Paul saying something very sharp against them, in this case, we're going to see another instance in a moment. Here, what does he do is he responds by a questioning. Paul knew very well that it was against Roman law to bind up a citizen of Rome to seek to flog or scourge a Roman citizen having not even been condemned. Paul had not been condemned. He had not been put up for trial. What they were doing essentially was against the law. Now, Now, think with me a little bit. They're accusing Paul for breaking the law. Who's breaking the law here? It's the tribune, and it's the centurion that's breaking the law. It's not Paul. And so it goes on, and it says here, When the centurion heard this, he went to the tribune and said to him, What are you about to do? So the centurion has the courage to go to his boss and to say, Hey, do you really realize what's going on here? Do you recognize that we are in the process of, of punishing a Roman citizen having not been tried? Obviously, that was not acceptable. What was happening here? The tribune was being carried along by the mob. The military leader was going along with what the people wanted. So what happened? So the tribune tribune came and said to him, uh, this is in verse 27, Actually, let's back it up to verse 26. We didn't finish verse 26. He asks the tribune, what are you about to do? For this man is a Roman citizen. The tribune was caught in a pickle in the corner here. So the tribune came and said to him, so the tribune comes up to the apostle Paul and questions him. Tell me, are you a Roman citizen? And Paul responds, yes. And the tribune answered. And here we find in the outline the tribune's reversal. The tribune's reversal. The tribune answered, I bought this citizenship for a large sum. Paul said, I am a citizen by birth. Now, you might think uh, perhaps in hearing and reading here that the tribune had purchased Roman citizenship that he basically was um, doing something inappropriate, doing something that might be illegal, but it was not the case. It was very um, appropriate and possible to purchase Roman citizenship. What what the, the tribune did was legitimate. However, it's one step down from actually having being or having been a Roman citizen by birth. So what does Paul do here? Paul one-ups him, doesn't he? He says, okay, you've bought Roman citizenship. I've got Roman citizenship since I was born. Really puts the tribune in his place by what he says. Verse 29. So those who were about to examine him withdrew from him immediately. And the tribune also was afraid. See what's going on here? Here is this this big military honcho. Now he's running around with his tail between his legs because he knew he was caught and he was in trouble. The punishment was going to then go to him, the tribune, as opposed to the apostle Paul. So look at the end of verse 29. He realized that Paul was a Roman citizen and that he had bound him. So what happens? The beginning of verse 30. On the next day, desiring to know the real reason why he was being accused by the Jews, he unbound him and commanded the chief priests and all the council to meet, and he brought Paul down and set him before them. So what did he do? He let Paul go. So Paul, in defending himself, resulted in him, in this case, we know that in other cases it wasn't so, but at least in this case we know he was not scourged at this point. And he was at least unbound from the chains that had him. 
So what happens here? Well, the, the tribune calls for a meeting with the Sanhedrin. And here he wants to basically rid himself of what, uh, what is happening in terms of the Roman government and, t- and turn Paul over to the Sanhedrin, the religious leaders. So he calls for a meeting. Paul is unbound. And now what is Paul doing? The second major head of your outline, if you're following again, is that Paul is appearing before the council. He's appearing before the council, and this would have been, again, the Sanhedrin. The highest um, religious, Jewish religious leaders. There were 70 of them in the, of the Sanhedrin. And what do we see here? In the beginning of verse 1 of chapter 23, Paul, it's, it said, Luke writes that what Paul does here is he looks intently at the council. And this carries the idea of staring at them. He's staring at these men. He's, his, his gaze is fixed upon them intently. He's watching them, what they're doing, what they're saying. Now, we should assume here, and we'll see why in just a moment, we should actually assume that there's a lot of hubbub going on here. There's a lot of riffraff going on here. Why? Because when someone would appear before the Sanhedrin, typically you would find that the men would form a circle. And the person that's being accused would be in the center of the circle. And just outside that circle would be clearly seen and understood to be the high priest. We don't find this going on here. So the best way to understand that is with all of the hubbub that's going on, all the chaos that's going on, they're not using the standard approach to question someone. And again, we'll see that in a moment. So here, what does Paul do? He makes a statement to the uh, Sanhedrin that completely blew them away. He says in uh, the middle of verse 1, Brothers, I have lived my life before God in all good conscience up to this day. This really made the religious leaders mad. Why? Because the religious leaders, the Sanhedrin, And as we see here in the text, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, they thought they were the ones following God and and everybody else was not. Paul here is turning the tables on them. And Paul is saying, I'm the one following God and you are not. Well, of course that's not going to make them happy, right? Of course that's not going to say, whoa, yeah, boy, I guess we're all kind of Spiritually in trouble here, right? No. By the way, something I didn't mention. This is the fifth time that the the gospel and the claims of Christ were put before the Sanhedrin. Five times Jesus appeared before the Sanhedrin before he was crucified in John 18. Peter and John appeared before the Sanhedrin in Acts chapter 4. The 12 apostles appeared before the Sanhedrin in Acts chapter 5. Stephen appeared before the Sanhedrin in Acts 6, 12 through 17. And here is Paul in Acts 23 appearing for the Sanhedrin. And here are these religious leaders hearing once again the claims of Christ and the gospel of Christ. Doesn't that show you something about the grace and the patience of God? You would think, why? If, if this, this group of, of, of religious leaders were, were so sold out on, on rejecting Christ, even at the trial of Jesus, before he was condemned to die, that God would have simply wiped them all out. He doesn't do that. He gives them four more times to hear about the claims of Christ. Unbelievable grace and patience on the part of God. But you know what the Bible says. To whom much is given, 
much is required. So if you are given five times to hear and respond to the gospel, and you reject that gospel, your eternal punishment will be more severe. Perhaps there are some that are here. You've heard the gospel before. Perhaps you've heard it a number of times. Maybe you've heard the gospel ever since you were a child and you have not embraced Christ. God may, he may not, give you more opportunity. But don't count on it. He may actually not give you another opportunity. That's why Paul had written to the Corinthians that now is the acceptable time and today is the day of salvation. Now is the time to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ to be saved. Now is the time to repent of your sin. It was then that these men should have repented of their sin and seen that they were the lawbreakers here. And we'll see that in just a moment. Here we find that Paul is saying that he has been living up to that very day with a good conscience. What does that mean, to live with a clear conscience? It means that Paul was doing what God wanted him to do. It meant that God was for him. It meant that Paul was in the right before God and they were not. Paul wrote to to, um, Pastor Timothy, in the church of Ephesus. In 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 5, he said, The goal of our instruction is love. From a pure faith, a good conscience. The goal of our instruction is love from a, from a pure faith and a good conscience. There are some people who have a pure conscience, according to 1 Timothy 3.9. There are some who have a weak conscience, according to 1 Corinthians 8.10. There are some who have a defiled conscience, Titus 1.15. There are some who have an evil conscience, Hebrews 10.22. And there are some who have a seared conscience. You know what a seared conscience is? A seared conscience is where, uh, metaphorically speaking, around your heart, has built up all kinds of scar tissue so that when the word of God comes and the gospel comes to you, you reject it because your heart has gotten so hard to the things of God. So the Sanhedrin is completely outraged at what Paul is saying, that Paul should have the audacity to say that he could be in the right and all of them could be in the wrong. So what happens here? Point two, Ananias' command in verse two. And the high priest Ananias commanded those who stood by him to strike him on the mouth. Paul got belted. And by the way, the, the wording here is he got hit with a fist right in the mouth. So the high priest here is ordering the Apostle Paul to get slammed right in, the, right in the face and in the mouth. We see here Paul reacting. Verse 3. Paul said to him, God's going to strike you, you whitewashed wall. Paul reacts. Paul responds. After he gets hit, after he gets belted, after he gets punched in the face, he says, look, God's going to get you for what you have done. And you are nothing but a whitewashed wall. You are clean on the outside, but you are dirty on the inside. Do you remember that Jesus got punched in the mouth in the face too? When he appeared before the Sanhedrin, In John 18, verses 19 through 23, Jewish law said that he who strikes a Jewish person 
strikes the Holy One. Paul knew that. Paul realized that what was being ordered to be done to him was against Jewish law. Once again, who's breaking the law here? It's the high priest and it's the person or people that either punched or were punching him. They were the ones breaking the law, not Paul. Now, we need to be fair here. It wasn't proper what Paul did here. Paul's reaction and response was not appropriate. You say, wait a minute. Jesus said to the Pharisees, you are whitewashed tombs filled with dead men's bones, Matthew 23. You say, how can that not be appropriate if Paul said that? Because Jesus said that. Jesus was God. Paul was not God. In fact, in Exodus chapter, I believe it's 22, yes. Exodus 22, verse 28, it reads, You shall not revile God nor curse a ruler of your people. So what Paul did here, we understand, was sin. And you know what? Paul recognizes it in the text. Paul understands that he sinned against God by saying what he said. It says here, and it goes on in verse 3, Are you sitting to to judge me according to the law, and yet contrary to the law you order me to be struck? So once again, Paul is saying, you are judging me, and yet it's you, the one that is breaking the law. Verse 4, Those who stood by said, Would you revile God's high priest? In that question, you know that's coming right from Exodus 22, 28. They knew that text. And then Paul says in verse 5, he says, I did not know, brothers, that he was the high priest. Now we're going to cut Paul some slack here. We're we're going to imagine that in the hubbub and the chaos of people going all around in terms of the religious leaders, Paul probably did not recognize who the high priest was in all of the group there. Some would believe that Paul had an eyesight problem and maybe could not have clearly seen who was the high priest. So Paul says, I didn't know, brothers, that he was the high priest, for it is written. Now, just watch this carefully. Watch what Paul does to himself. Paul quotes scripture against himself. Catch it. He says, I did not know, brothers, that he was the high priest, for it is written, you shall not speak evil of a ruler of your people. So what is Paul doing? The uh, religious leader here is asking Paul a question coming from Exodus 22, 28. And what does Paul do? Paul quotes it. And in Paul quoting it, he was repenting. And he was recognizing that what he was doing was wrong. And what he has said was incorrect. Jesus did not need to do that because Jesus is God. So we see here that that Paul is recognizing that what he did was actually wrong. So we find even someone like the Apostle Paul makes mistakes and repents from them. That's how you keep a good conscience before God. When you sin, when you say something you shouldn't, when you respond in a way that you shouldn't, when you do something that you shouldn't, Quote scripture to yourself. You ever do that? You should. Talk to your own soul and say, you know what? This passage, this passage, this passage. You start to worry. You start to be fearful. 
Quote scripture to yourself. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication. You start to fear. Quote scripture to yourself. You start sinning. You do something that's sinful. Quote the word of God to your own soul. Paul does it. So we find here that Ananias commands him to be struck. And then Paul responds back very strongly, recognizing he was wrong, quotes scripture to himself. And then thirdly, under the second heading, we see the religious leader's conflict. Starting in verse 6. When Paul perceived that the one part were Sadducees and the others Pharisees, he cried out in the council, Brothers, I'm a Pharisee, a son of Pharisees. It's with respect to the hope and the resurrection of the dead that I am on trial. What Paul does here is he recognizes that some of the men that were there were Sadducees. Some of them were Pharisees. Paul was a Pharisee. Of the two groups, Paul was a Pharisee. What was a Pharisee? Just in very general terms, a Pharisee was a fundamentalist. A Pharisee was a supernaturalist. A Pharisee was one who believed in the resurrection from the dead and in angels. Sadducees were the liberals, were the anti-supernaturalists who did not believe in the resurrection, who did not believe in angels. And what Paul here does is he sides with the Pharisees. And he says to all of them that the real reason that he was being put on trial was for the hope and the resurrection from the dead. That's the end of verse 6. Paul recognized that the real reason that they were against him was because he was preaching a message of hope. Think of that. They would rather have a message that with no hope? Think of it. They would rather have a message with no hope of any future resurrection? Hopeless. They'd rather be hopeless. The Pharisees believed in that. So what did they do? The Pharisees here cut, cut him some slack. It says here, When he said this, a dissension rose between the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and the assembly was divided. For the Sadducees say, say there's no resurrection, nor angel, nor spirit. But the Pharisees acknowledged them all. Then a great clamor arose, and some of the scribes of the Pharisees' party stood up and contended sharply. We find nothing wrong in this man. They cut Paul slack and they side with him. Paul sides with the Pharisees. The Pharisees side with him. And they ask, what if a spirit or an angel spoke to this man? They believed in that. And by the way, do you remember that when Paul had just given his testimony a couple of days before, Paul had said that Jesus had appeared to him on the road to Damascus. That's resurrection. He was telling them about the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And this would have thrown them, certainly the Sadducees. So Paul had preached in talking about Jesus being alive that he had been raised from the dead. And then there was a sharp contention. There was a big conflict between the religious leaders. Look at verse 10. When the dissension became violent, the tribune, he gets involved again, afraid that Paul would be torn to pieces by them. You can, you can see what's going on. You've got the Pharisees probably grabbing one arm. You've got the Sadducees probably grabbing the other arm. And they were just doing a tug of war. On Paul. And the, and the tribune is afraid they're going to tear him into pieces. What did he do? He commanded the soldiers to go down and take him away from among them by force and bring him into the barracks. So in the midst of the conflict, the tribune actually helps Paul. He rescues him. 
He gets him out of the situation so that he may go into the barracks. And then what happens? Lastly, God's comfort. God's comfort. Paul was really at the bottom here. He was really at the bottom. And what does he do? What does Jesus do? The following night, what does it say? The Lord stood by him and said, Take courage. For as you have testified of the facts about me in Jerusalem, so you must testify also in Rome. See, Jesus didn't leave him alone. He appeared to him. He came to him. And he encouraged him. And he told him, take courage. Essentially, I'm with you. That must have greatly encouraged the heart of the Apostle Paul. Do you know that Jesus had appeared to Paul five times, including his, uh, at his conversion? Why did Jesus appear to Paul here? Why at this point? Because Paul was at the bottom. And Paul needed encouragement. And there wasn't going to be anyone that was going to be able to encourage him like Jesus himself could. So Jesus comes on the scene and stands with his servant, the Apostle Paul, and, and exhorts him to take courage. Please look at w- with me at 2 Timothy chapter 4. This is the last letter Paul wrote just before he died. And by the way, just by way of time frame, when these events took place in Paul's life, he still lived a number of years later. And as we saw, and we'll mention again, Jesus was calling him to testify in Rome. Look at 2 Timothy chapter 4, starting in verse 16. At my first defense, no one came to stand by me, but all deserted me. May it not be charged against them. You see the mercy of the Apostle Paul here? Paul had been abandoned, left alone. And rather than Paul lashing out at these that had abandoned him and turned on him, what does he say in the end of verse 16? Basically, he's saying, may it not be charged against them. May God have mercy upon them. Look at verse 17. But the Lord stood by me and strengthened me so that through me the message might be fully proclaimed and all the Gentiles might hear it. So I was rescued from the lion's mouth. Paul was looking over his shoulder about what had happened to him. And in this text also, he relates and he writes to Timothy that Jesus stood by him. Jesus did not abandon him. Jesus did not leave him alone. When Paul was in his greatest need, there was Jesus for him. Have you ever felt that way? Yourself? Have you ever felt that low? Have you ever felt, I don't know where I'm going to go from here? I don't know what's going to happen to me. I don't know what's going to happen to my family. I don't know what's going to happen in my future. What do you do in circumstances like that? You call out to God. You cry out to Christ. We should cast our cares upon him because he cares for us. And don't we see that right here? Don't we see that Jesus is caring for Paul? Does Jesus only care for Paul? No. If you are a child of God, if you are a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ, he cares for you too. He will stand by you too. He will never leave us. He will never forsake us, the Bible promises. Do you believe that? Do you remember that when the disciples were in the boat and the storm came up 
and the disciples were really afraid. And it's understandable. I'm not criticizing them. I would have been too. You would have been too. And the storm uh, comes up, and they thought, this is it. This is going to capsize. We're going to drown. Jesus appears on the scene, and what happens? He says to his disciples, take courage. And then Jesus calmed the storm as only he could. Jesus will meet you where you are. In the middle of your storm, he will meet you. He will find you because he knows where you are. He knows what you're thinking. He knows how you're feeling. Everything about you, he knows. He's not going to abandon you. He's not going to leave you. He did not leave the Apostle Paul. And he will not leave you either. Trust in him. Cling to that truth. Hold on to that with all of your soul. Would you rather simply disbelieve that it's true? Yeah, there are times in our life when we ask ourselves, Jesus, are you really there? Do you really know what I'm going through? He does. Praise God, he does. Let's pray together. Our Lord and our God, we thank you that you are such a God to us that you will not abandon us. We think, Lord, of even the days in the life of Joshua and how you called him to lead your people into the promised land and he realized that that was so far beyond him. And so you came to him and you commanded him, be strong. Have I not commanded you to be strong? We remember, Lord, the days of the life of your servant Moses. When you came to him and you told him to go to Pharaoh, and Moses knew it was so far beyond his ability in and of himself. And you gave him the grace. We know, Lord, that when the Apostle Paul was going through the sufferings of the thorn in the flesh, you promised to him that your strength would be enough for him. Would you help us, Lord? You know what we're going through. You know, Lord, how we respond to situations. You know that sometimes our tendency is to disbelieve that you're here, that you're for us and with us. Help our unbelief, Lord. And we pray for any here, Lord, that don't know you, that, Lord, you might help them to see that there is the hope and the resurrection from the dead through the Lord Jesus Christ and his own resurrection, that there is the forgiveness of sin through him, that there is having a right place before you, and that there is a purpose of serving you. We know in this text, Lord, you called the Apostle Paul your servant to Rome and you stood with him so that he would then be able to go to Rome and serve you and extend your kingdom and speak of you there. We know, Lord, that when you stand with us, when you come to us, it is so that we would be able to be encouraged, but we know, Lord, that your purpose is that we would be able to make you known before others. Help us to serve those purposes, Lord. And we pray for these things in Christ's name. Amen.